This story, originally published in 1870, was first called The Awful, Terrible, Medieval Romance and was about 3,000 words. It is significantly reduced here a medieval romance. One windswept evening in the year 1222 in the feudal castle of Klugenstein, a secret council was held between the lord of Klugenstein and his daughter, who had been named Conrad and raised as a young man of noble presence. Daughter, the old lord said, the time has come to tell you why your true gender has been hidden from the world. My brother Ulrich is the great Duke of Brandenburg. On his deathbed, our father decreed that if no son was born to Ulrich, but one was born to me, the throne would pass to my son. If only daughters were born to both of us, Ulrich's daughter would ascend to the throne. So all who witnessed your birth were put to death. Except your mother, of course. Ulrich has only a daughter, so the throne is yours for the taking. Since he has become as feeble as I, he has asked that you come to him right away and become duke. In act, though not yet in name, you leave tonight. Now listen, and remember well each word I say. There's a law as old as the earth that if any woman sits for a single instant on the ducal throne before she has been crowned in the presence of people, she shall die. So listen close. Pretend humility. Pronounce your judgments from the foot of the throne, not from the throne itself. Your sex may never be discovered, but if it is, your power is safe after you have been crowned. But if you violate this ancient law before you are crowned, nothing can save you from a horrible death. Though Conrad had misgivings about this terrible deception, he, or she, set off with his retinue for the Duchy of Brandenburg and was welcomed with open arms by Ulrich and his court. But in a remote apartment of Brandenburg Castle, Ulrich's only daughter, Constance, was weeping. Her secret lover, hearing of Conrad's arrival, had fled for fear that with all of the changes that were bound to occur, their illicit affair would be discovered. Ulrich was sure to plan a horrible death for the lad, since he had told the low-born boy more than once to stay away from the Lady Constance. Her lover's departure, of course, left Lady Constance bereft and lonely. Ulrich's heart was filled with happiness because he loved Conrad as soon as he set eyes on the young heir. A few months drifted by, and Conrad began to win the favor of Ulrich and all the people of Brandenburg. The old duke soon gave everything into Conrad's hands, sitting apart and listening with proud satisfaction as his heir delivered decrees from in front of the throne. But here the plot thickens. Conrad began to catch the rapt attention of Lady Constance, who was desperate to fill the hold in her heart. Conrad welcomed this attention because he needed all the allies he could get in order to be crowned quickly before his deception was discovered. And secretly he longed for the comfort and companionship of another woman, for the sympathy and support that only a woman can give. This apparent romance pleased Ulrich greatly for a pairing of the two would unite the kingdom. But the girl began to haunt Conrad, to hunt him in all places night and day. The princess had begun to love him. He tried to avoid her, but she persisted. Finally, one night, she came upon him in an abandoned hallway and flung her arms around his neck so he could not escape her. She said, why do you avoid me? We were becoming such good friends, and now 
You run from me, but you can avoid me no longer. I love you, Conrad, and you will love me as well. Conrad ripped her arms from around his neck and cried, You don't know what you're asking. It's forever and ever impossible. He fled, devastated, and the poor girl stood in stunned amazement. The second rejection in only a few months drove Constance out of her mind. Her anger boiled within her. To think... He was despising my love at the very moment I thought I was melting his cruel heart. He spurned me like a dog. How I hate him. Surely she would find a way to have her revenge. Conrad continued to grow in favor, and his confidence and wisdom grew. But the Lady Constance was nowhere to be seen. Soon a rumor swept the kingdom, and all the way back to Klugenstein, a rumor that Constance had given birth to a child. Conrad's father rejoiced in the news, knowing that since Ulrich's daughter had brought such shame on herself, the coronation of Conrad would proceed apace. He departed for Brandenburg to attend the trial of the princess in order to watch Conrad's moment, a final triumph. As acting duke, it fell to Conrad to conduct the trial of Constance. He begged to be relieved of the duty, but this was his test of fitness for the throne he could not refuse. All the great lords and barons of Brandenburg were assembled in the palace. The prisoner... Constance was called forth. The Lord Chief Justice declared that the penalty for giving birth out of wedlock by ancient law was death, unless she delivered up the father of the child to the executioner. It fell to Conrad to give that sentence. Reluctantly, Conrad stood at the base of the throne and stretched forth his scepter, while at the same time his womanly heart yearned in pity toward the doomed prisoner. The chief justice stopped him and said, Not there, your grace. It is not lawful to pronounce judgment on any of the royal blood except from the ducal throne. But Conrad had not been crowned. The words of his father returned to him. If any woman sits for a single instant in the ducal chair before she has been crowned in the presence of the people, she shall die. Yet he ascended the throne and made the required pronouncement. His eyes met those of Constance, and he pleaded with her, the ancient law provides an opportunity to save you from death, deliver up the name of the Father for execution, and you will be spared. Her eyes burned with hatred, and she declared, It is you, you are the father of my child. What could Conrad do? He could prove it was not him by revealing himself to be a woman on penalty of death. Or he could remain silent on penalty of death. At one and the same moment, he and his grim old father swooned and fell to the ground. Well, it's a perplexing dilemma. The truth is, I have got my hero or heroine, into such a particularly close place that I don't see how I am ever to get him or her out of it again, and therefore I wash my hands of the whole business. I thought it was going to be easy to straighten out that little difficulty, but it looks impossible now.